with experience leave with money. And the Lord impressed up on my wife and destiny. They said it to me. It jumped in my spirit that we needed to come because the declaration that I am saying to you today is that when you leave here, you are no longer the borrower. But you are the lender. How many of you know the word says that? Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is not the man. He's not a man that he should lie nor is he the son of man that should repent. I think it's one of the most important scriptures in the Bible because God only responds to people who believe him. You can't go to heaven unless you believe him. You can sin, be forgiven, but if you don't believe, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The reason why I'm setting this stage is because many people will leave here and say, that, that service was a farce. It didn't work. No, you brought you, but you didn't, believe, you didn't bring your belief. <laughs> Remember what Jesus says to the disciples. He says, how long must I deal with you, you perverse and unbelieving generation? I pray that all doubt would leave this room. That God has enough to answer every one of our prayers. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Eternal Spirit, it's once again that I come asking your permission to preach, not to entertain, but to proclaim that you are Jesus the Christ. Use me and guide me, order my steps in your word. Hide me behind your cross, cover me in your blood that they see none of me. But Lord, all of you, I'm yours. Your mind, use me as an instrument. Have me to play the tune of your choice. I'll be careful to give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout, I'm free. I see debt falling in the spirit. First Kings chapter 18. I don't know what's about to happen in this service. I don't know what's about to happen, but I know something is about to happen. Now, how many of you all uh, got the instructions when they were coming in about putting your debt at the altar? Now, real quickly, if y'all can do this real quick before I read the scripture, um, bring up the tabernacle on the screen if y'all can do that real quick. Let me show you something. Wow, okay, good. The reason why I had you to do this I want, to explain, I want to express and explain something to you. We always switch God's plan and wonder why the results don't work. Okay? So what we've done or what we've typically had to do is we had to put the offering somewhere in the middle or the end of service because how many of y'all know a lot of the saints don't show up to service is almost over. But let me show you, God was so serious about giving that in the tabernacle, the offering took place before anything else did. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. The first thing you did in the Old Testament was give your offering. You didn't have to wait on the sermon to change your heart. You didn't have to wait on the song to, to, to prompt your spirit. They came ready to give. The first thing you had to do before you could even think about worshiping at the altar. God says, I don't want to hear your worship until I see your seed. And many of us want to, we want to skip over this and want to do this, and yet even some have the audacity to want to be in the holies of holies and ask for a miracle from God. He says, before I can give you a miracle, before you see glory, be, before I can see worship, Here's the table of showbread with the 12 tribes of Israel represented on it. Watch this. This is the labor. In other words, you had to be clean to worship. This is where you washed your hands and your feet. But before you got clean, you were a giver. 
I'm trying to show you how to get giving in the, in the crevices of your heart and not as a reaction or response to try to pimp God into doing something for you. For God loves a... I'm showing you how to get money. I'm showing you how to be set free. But you must, everybody say, believe. believe. Now, I already know that only about 3% of you all are going to get what I'm saying today. But I want you to let your neighbor know, I don't know about you, but I'm in the three. I don't know about you, but I'm in the three. You can do what you want to do, but I know what I'm here to do. You can say what you want to say. You can doubt what you want to doubt. But I'm tired of seeing other people have my stuff. I'm tired of looking at other people who don't worship or pray have the stuff that my father promised me. So you can do what you want to do, but I came to get it. Some, somebody shout, I came to get it. I came not, I didn't come to get some of it. I came to get all of it. Not half of it, but all of it. Not most of it, but all of it. And to every doubter in the room, let me speak on behalf of all believers. We'll take your stuff too. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. Look at somebody who ain't said nothing all day and just tell them, I'll take your stuff too. I got some people I want to bless. I need a blessing big enough that I don't have room enough to receive it. I'll take yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. Now do me one more favor before I read this scripture. All of the blessed people look at somebody and say, oh baby, you can't have mine. What God has for me, it is for me. It can't no devil in hell, no liar in church, no witch on the job take what God has for me. Something about to happen. Something's about to happen. Something's about to happen. Something's about to happen. Something's about to happen for you because in the morning service, I'm watching y'all online, and the glory of the Lord was in this room. And every one of you all will invite it to come back. Some people decided, oh, I'm going to watch it online. Some people decided, oh, I'm too tired to go. Some people are out of town and they cannot go. But let me give you a special announcement. For those of you who could, you don't know how you just moved God. I'm not talking about people who couldn't. I'm talking about people who wouldn't. I'm talking about people who was tired but got up anyway. I'm talking about people who had to rush. I'm talking about people who had to find a babysitter. I'm talking about people who still got to go to work in the morning. Somebody say, I'm glad when they said unto me. Something's about to happen. Okay. All right. Y'all going to save some of that. I'm only asking you to save it because I don't know how much you got. I need some of it for later. Now, if you got enough, we can do it. But, but, but if you, if you, if you, if you, you know, if you're, if you're one of them saints that only got one good shout in you, I'm asking you to save it. Now, don't use it early if you ain't got more than one. Don't. So before we preach, I, remember I told you all that I preached a couple weeks ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a, a man was introducing me, and then I found out that he was running these dream centers and all that kind of stuff. Pastor Tim Newton is here standing here. He's on the front row. Y'all praise God for him. He's here to show us how to make sure, some of y'all been in church as long as me, that our dream center don't become a fellowship hall. Y'all know what I'm talking about. The place in the church that smell like fried chicken and, and is only used for cooking and it no, that thing gonna be popping every day of the week. We're about to change thousands of young people's lives from all around the world in the name of Jesus Christ. 
If you down for changing a generation, holler at your boy. Pastor Tim, thank you. He's been here all weekend. He'll be here tomorrow in staff meeting. He's showing us what to do. Uh, they have a dream center in Tulsa, Oklahoma that's cracking. They built a splash pad for $2 million. <laughs> a splash pad. Pay for it cash. $1.8 million just for kids to run through water. See, see, if you're going to change a generation, you have to invest in it. I got to, okay, I got work to do. First Kings chapter 18. And it came to pass, verse 17, when Ahab saw Elijah and Ahab said unto him, Thou art he that troubleth Israel. Do you know that when you shake up a system, you think you're blessing them, they look at you as trouble. You'd be surprised how many people you came to help that you're bothering. Elijah was the best thing that happened to him. He said, but you're messing up my system. You're messing up how I do things. So he calls them trouble. I want to tell you, by the time I finish with you, some of y'all going to be in trouble, trouble, trouble. Some of y'all going to be in trouble with the enemy after you finish here tonight. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou. Basically, he's saying, no, you and your daddy did this because y'all stopped listening to God and followed Baal. And therefore send and gather to me all of Israel unto Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal 450 and the prophets of the groves another 400 which eat at Jezebel's table. See, most people call Jezebel uh, that the female spirit uh, that entices a man into illicit activity. That ain't what Jezebel is. So when you look at a woman say, oh, Jezebel, and you're talking about her being, you know, this scandalous woman, that ain't, Jezebel was way more sophisticated than sex. Jezebel was, had people changing gods. So there are men with the Jezebel spirit. I want to free women from that, from that scarlet letter. That men have used that as a terminology to demean women. It has nothing to do with gender. It all, it has everything to do with spirit. Therefore he said, Ahab sent unto the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elisha said unto all the people and said, how long are you going to be double-minded? You can't serve God and mammon. A double-minded man or woman is unstable. How long are you going to be between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal be God, follow him. And notice when it came time to make a decision, they said not a word. Be careful with people who are silent at speaking time. Neutral people are the worst kind of people. They don't want to upset nobody. But when you can't pick me and you can't pick them, you just pick them. Where do you stand? Who's on the Lord's side? Then said Elijah unto people, I even only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets 450. Let me hurry up and tell you what happened. He said, so make an altar. Let them bring the bulls, cut them into pieces, put them on the altar. 
tell them to call Bell and see if he'll bring fire down to burn it up. And they called on Bell and got no answer. Then he rebuilt the altar with 12 stones. Remember I told you that the, the 12 loaves of bread on the table of showbread. He built the, the altar with 12 stones because each stone represented one of the tribes of Israel. And then he put wood in the trench and he says, let's, let's make this a little difficult. Put water on it. How many of you know you can't burn wet wood? He said, you know what? Let's, let's make it, a, put water on it again. Matter of fact, one for the father, one for the son. Put water on it again. He called from heaven and the Bible says that the fire came down, burnt the wood, the stones, and the dust and the water, the Bible says, and it licked the water in the trench. From that day forward, I don't think they had no doubt who the real God was. For all of you all who have been wondering if God hears you, today I want to talk about the God who answers. Fist bump everybody you can reach and tell them our God hears and answers prayer. The God that answers. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. One of the most powerful forces on earth is a simple word called affirmation. Affirmation is so powerful that it works on pets and people. The only way to properly train a dog is to request a command and then affirm it after it responds to the command which puts the pet in the state of mind, you love me, you affirm me, and so I'm going to repeat this behavior simply for your affirmation. Same way with people. Psychologists will tell you in relationships that the way to have your relative, your loved one to repeat a behavior is to affirm them when they do what you were asking them to do. So it's amazing how much we fuss, but how little we affirm. You didn't do it, 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 you didn't do it. But when I do do it, you say, well, that's what you should have done. You can't get anybody to repeat what you don't affirm. Are you with me so far? It's what Gary Chapman was, was, was really trying to express to us when he wrote the book called The Five Love Languages. In their essence, all five of them are actually just affirmation because if you touch me, you're affirming me. If you give me acts of service, you're affirming me. If you give me words of adoration, you are affirming me. If you give me gifts, you are affirming me. Everybody in this room, I don't care who you are, you love affirmation. How many of you ever seen anybody in, in multi-level marketing? And, and, and truthfully, there is a lot of money in it, but, but there are a lot of people in it who don't make a lot of money. You know why most people don't make a lot of money in multi-level marketing? It's, be, it's not because multi-level marketing doesn't work, because all marketing is multi-level. The reason why a lot of people don't make a lot of money in multi-level marketing is because once they get to the stage and they hit a certain pin level, they stop working hard because it was never about the money, it was about the affirmation. 
That once they get the trophy, once they get the card, once they get the car, once they get the plaque, then they stop working hard. And let me tell you, it is very true that the person next to you may tell you, I don't care what nobody thinks about me. That's their defense mechanism for not being disappointed because everybody cares at least about what somebody thinks about them. Are you with me so far? Everybody say affirmation. affirmation. Psychologists have even suggested in their studies that affirmation has the power to reprogram the subconscious mind. That if you are in a conflict with somebody, they say that one of the ways to shorten the gap between the conflict and the forgiveness is simply affirmation. I appreciate you. You're, you're, you're worthy of what you get. You're amazing. And the affirmation doesn't always have to be a reflection of the true identity of the relationship. In other words, affirmations work even if the person isn't. That you can actually affirm a person into being what you uh, uh, need them to be as opposed to fussing at them in hopes that they will become. You can affirm what hasn't yet occurred. Oh, everybody, you, if you miss this, you're going to miss the sermon. I, I love, you, you can come to a person, I love the way you treat me. I, I love the way you speak to me every time I pass by you. They may never speak to you, but once you affirm it, subconsciously they're going to make sure that every time They're going to speak. Why? Because everybody loves affirmation. When something responds to us, it makes us feel wanted. When something responds to us, it makes you feel safe. Men, more so than women, men live for response. I wish we were in a couple's class right now. <laughs> we'll do that one next time off the internet. <laughs> she said, I need it, Reverend. We, we. Do you remember that there was a young lady in the Bible, her name was Leah, she was married semi to a man named Jacob? <clears throat> I mean, semi because really he didn't want her her dad, Laban, said, you can have her for seven years of wages, and, and after that, I'll give you Rachel, the one you really want. And he doesn't want her because the Bible says she's cross-eyed. Well, tender-eyed, I'm sorry. I, <clears throat> don't nobody here know what tender-eyed means. She, she, she had a lazy eye to just... And because Jacob didn't affirm her, she kept giving him children. And she named every one of the children after what she wanted from him. She named one Reuben, she named another one Simeon, and all three of these mean, I need you to hear me, to see me, or to connect to me. Every one of the children, if you read their names, Hear me, see me, connect to me. It wasn't until she found out that having children for him wouldn't work that she named the fourth son Judah, which means to praise. Because she finally realized, I'm not going to get it from here. But I am going to get it from here. She says, since you won't hear me, since you won't see me, since you won't connect to me, this time I'll praise the Lord. Affirmation. Everybody wants to feel valued. Everybody wants to feel wanted. Are we in agreement on the premise of the message? Let's get into the word of God. The time has come for Elijah to solidify his prominence as the premier prophet of Israel. And everybody and I mean everybody, has gotten to the place where they've turned their back on Jehovah. Well, you, you, you would too. I know we, we like to think that that's, uh, 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 that's, that's foolishness, but uh, imagine that you were in slavery for 400 years. 
Imagine that you looked at your mama walking barefoot in slavery and then passing on into the wilderness with no water and no food, only except it comes out of a rock, a manna comes down from heaven. Imagine you are serving God and nothing is happening. So they began to complain and they turned their back on God and Baal seems like a good alternative. They turned their back on Jehovah. Jehovah God, the one who created the universe to serve somebody who was created by the universe. Oh, you're going to get this in a minute. And now it is time for Elijah to stand up and say, I am, I am, I am the prominent prophet. And if you read this story, you will find out that this story takes place at the tip of a mountain called Mount Carmel. Can I just tell you right here real quick and park and then pull off most of your biggest test will come at your highest points. That sometimes we think that, that when we get to the high place, when we get the job we've been praying for, when we finally get the family we've been looking for, when we finally have the spouse that we've been looking for, when our children get to a certain age or stage, we think that life is going to go on easy street. But let me tell you, the enemy always tempts you at the highest place. Remember, Jesus was at the mountain. He says, jump off. See if your father will come and send angels to get you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Your biggest test will come at your highest place. Not only will it come at the highest place, but it will come at the driest place because it hasn't rained in three and a half years. Can y'all just stay with me for a second? It hasn't rained in three years, and when there is no rain, the cattle die. When there is no rain, the lakes dry up. When there is no rain, the plants are not growing. When there is no rain, everything is, is atrophying, so there is no rain. And if you remember, you just go back one chapter. Elijah said, oh, y'all turned y'all back on God? He said, God, do me a favor. Hold back the rain. Oh, let me just clear up your theology because most people say that God held back the rain. No, God did what Elijah said. If you go back and read the text, Elijah asked God to hold back the rain. Can I just tell you, you don't even know how much power you have. You have enough power to ask God to hold back the rain. That's why you better make sure you pick your enemies very carefully. Because you sit next to somebody that God listens to. You, you, you sit next to somebody that if, if they ask God to do it. Touch your neighbor and say, you don't know me, but I can get a prayer through. <laughs> you, you, you don't know me, but I can get a prayer through. Just one word from me to my daddy, I'll set this whole place on fire. I, I'll set it off in this place. Touch, I'm, so you sit next to somebody who can get a prayer through. This is how I fight my battles. I won't hit you with my hand because you can recover from that. But if I call on my daddy, Elijah said, hold back the rain. And for three plus years, not a drop. Can you imagine how high they water bill was? trying to water their grass. Can you imagine? Not a drop of rain. Now, we don't like rain, but when it don't rain for too long, we start saying, Lord. No rain. The test came at a high place and at a dry place. That dry place when you don't have nothing to give. I don't have time for a test right now. That dry place when you don't have any, you don't have any prayer left. I don't have time for this right now. That dry place when you feel all alone. I don't have time for this. That dry place when your emotions have gotten the best of you and you feel depressed and you feel worthless and you feel insecure and you feel like there's nobody listening to you. You feel like you went to school and got the degree and now you wasted your time with all of that student loan debt because now you got a degree you can't use. That dry place when you're wondering why am I in this relationship or why did the relationship end after I gave it everything I had? The dry place. When you're giving your children everything you have but they don't give it back in return. The dry, anybody in a dry place? The dry place is the testing place. 
Because in order to survive this season, you're going to need something from God. The test doesn't come in surplus because when you have enough, you can survive a difficult time by what you have saved. So God will dry it up so you have nothing saved. So you can get saved. And rely on God. I, I know there's at least a thousand people online and at least a thousand people in this room that know what it's like to be in a dry place. Holler at me. A dry place. A frustrating place. A smile at work, broken hearted kind of place. So much anxiety that you don't have an appetite kind of place, losing weight, lying that you're working out, but you're really dying inside, kind of, oh, holler at me, kind of place, a dry place, and the test comes in the dry place, and they say to Ahab, says to Elijah, it's your fault. Elijah said, it ain't my fault. It's your fault. You and your daddy around here worshiping Baal. And I'm up here trying to tell y'all about the God who lives. There is inconsistency between what is actually happening because Ahab is blaming Elijah. And Elijah is blaming Ahab. There is inconsistency in this conclusion and this conversation. Elijah says, with all due respect, you ain't going to blame me for this. No, no. If you had to worship God like I worshiped him, then you'd be all right. Elijah says that to him. Boy, let me tell you, Ahab got so mad. He says, you know what? You are the trouble of Israel. That word trouble of Israel, troubler in the, in the Hebrew, it actually means to, watch this, to royal, not broil, to royal, R-O-I-L, to royal water. When you boil water, you purify it. When you royal water, you muddy it. So the word royal means to stir up the sediment and to make the water muddy. So what he's actually saying is, you're filthy. Coming around here talking about preaching, we can't see because of you. Talking about you got the word of the Lord in your mouth. Our lives are in the situation it's in because of you. Have you ever showed up for somebody to be helped but all they saw was hurt? Tried to give them some advice that would help them, but, but, but they couldn't see the advice because they were so used to status quo that they couldn't take technology? How many people have you been in their lives and they didn't recognize that you were an upgrade to them, but they were so used to where they were, they looked at you as trouble. Let me tell you something right now. Anybody who does not recognize when they, what they have when they have you is somebody who doesn't know what quality looks like. Let me say it again for somebody in the back. Anybody who doesn't recognize what they have when they have you is somebody who doesn't recognize quality. And you should never force somebody to buy boutique items who are used to garage sales. He didn't know what he had. With Elijah in his presence, I hate to tell you, some people don't know what they have when they got you. Can I just talk to 500 people? You have no idea. The problem is you judge me based on the flood or you judge me based on the drought, but you didn't know I was an answer to a prayer. You didn't know that soon and very soon God was going to use me to change the whole situation. Some of y'all need to be thanking God right now that they got rid of you before you realized who you were. That they blocked you on Instagram before you found out who you were. That they sent you the divorce papers before you forgot who you were. Why? Because now you can be what you need to be. Outside of the presence of somebody who would have never recognized it anyway. It was good that I was afflicted.
God wants to know, can I trust you when it dries up? Can I trust you to tithe when your bills are stacking up? Most of us quit God in a drought. Oh, don't you get quiet on me right now. Your behavior in the drought is why it has lasted so long. Your behavior in the wilderness is why it has lasted so long. It was supposed to be 13 days, but because your attitude dried up like the weather, it is now 40 years. God says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Then why is abundance taking so long? Attitude. Ashy. Dry. Some people go through something, but they can't go through it. They get in their feelings and they just suck. Have you ever seen? Everybody ain't able. Every time you get something nice, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, you the, you the blessed class, but everybody ain't able. I ain't go to school like you. I ain't have a mom and dad to give me nothing like you. Everybody ain't able. Baby, my mama didn't do this. God did it. My daddy didn't do this. God did it. My uncle didn't do this. God did it. Somebody say, God did. God did. They ain't believe in us. But God did. Some of y'all old don't even know what I'm talking about. Ahab said, no, it's your fault, you troublemaker. See, Ahab has the problem that people who cannot take responsibility have. Troublemakers always have problems with troubleshooters. They don't know the difference. Some people look at you as a troublemaker. They don't know that God sent you to be a troubleshooter. See, a troubleshooter is somebody who finds what's wrong. and gives you the solution to fixing the issue. But pride will make you look at a troubleshooter as a troublemaker. Ahab's pride wouldn't let him realize that God has sent him a blessing and not a burden. And now he is still burdened because he doesn't recognize he's in the presence of a blessing. He's calling the troubleshooter a troublemaker. And Ahab and his house and his wife and their table, they are the ones in trouble. Are you praying with me so far? God sent me here tonight to trace your terror and to show you how to walk out of this darkness into the marvelous light. But baby, let me tell you something. If you don't change your attitude, If you don't change your perspective, if you don't change the heart of the matter, and you look at this message as trouble, your drought will be here when you wake up. How many of y'all ready to be set free? One of the most detrimental things to the body of Christ is that we're so inconsistent. Can we just talk? I mean, we, we on a Sunday night. We're not, we don't got no other service next. This is what we came for. We're inconsistent. Sometimes we're up and worshiping. Sometimes we don't want to hear nothing that God has to say. Sometimes we start a diet. A diet turns into a doubt it. Sign up for the gym membership. I'm about to. Three days later. I'm about to be a vegan. I'm so tired of y'all. My grandmama ate steak and she lived in 98. I'm going to have some meat. I'm 
I'm about to be gluten free. <laughs> hey, point at somebody if you if you buy them and they done said this, just kind of let me know I'm talking to them. <laughs> She's like, don't do that, don't do that. I ain't come here to be embarrassed. Inconsistency. We'll go to church five, six, seven weeks in a row. God will answer the prayer. He don't see us for another two months. We're tithe when we believe in God for something, but when we get that thing we believe God for, then we stop. Show me your hands if you know you suffer with inconsistency. Look around. It's killing us. Anything you do consistently will work. Getting in shape is not about going to the gym three hours one day. It's about going 10 to 15 minutes every day. Consistency. Anything you do, a drop of water on a rock will break it in half over time because it is just consistent. It doesn't take a lot of pressure. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence. All it takes is consistency. If you consistently give, if you consistently save, if you consistently pray, then you'll look up and you'll have the life of your dreams. But the problem with the church is that we get in a rut and then we run into the house of the Lord and we think that one prayer at the altar is going to solve it all. And when it doesn't happen, the most famous statement ever said is, that's why I don't go to church. How many times have you ever seen that online? Have you ever heard somebody, that's why I don't go to church. Because it doesn't work. No, church works, God works, we don't. Inconsistent. Inconsistent. Elijah highlights something. He highlights the problem. He asked him a question. He says, how long are you going to be between Two opinions because now I see your second problem. Not only are you inconsistent, but you're indecisive. Now that y'all come to get set free, we're going to shout, I promise you, but I'm, I'm going to get there. But, but, but how many of y'all say, not only am I inconsistent, but I'm indecisive. Have you ever been uh, to the gas station with somebody who don't know what they want to drink? Ah. Uh, You ever been to somebody, Chick-fil-A? It ain't but five things. What are we waiting on? You, ah, uh, I want to, ah. Uh. I just want to say, give them a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got to go. <laughs> How many of you suffer with indecision? Can't make up your mind. Elijah says, you in this situation because you can't pick a route. E e either God's going to be God, I'm going somewhere, just follow me. Or Baal is going to be God. In other words, how long are you going to be paralyzed by what you didn't choose? How long? Are you going to be between, between two opinions? A house divided against itself. You can't stand. How long will it take you to take action? Which attitude are you going to choose? How, how long is it going to take you to realize that no matter what's happening in your life, you have the power to decide whether you're going to be mad about it or happy about it? Because all an attitude is, is a lack of choice. That's all silence is, is a lack of choice. Either, either you, can, you can fuss about it and get it over with or get over it without fussing, but, but silence is just indecision. 
and we're suffering because we don't choose. We won't choose the word of God over the opinions that we have, and so we're stuck in between. Right in between destiny and history, which is what they call no man's land. I'm, I'm, I'm as far from my future as I am from my past. If I turn around and go back, it's going to take me the same amount of time as if I walk toward the mark of the prize of the upward call. Somebody shout indecision. They were trying to unite Baal worship with God worship, and they couldn't pick. How do I know? Because when he said it, what was their response? Nothing. They said not a word. Now I'm ready to preach because this is where Elijah went off. I'm about to go off on y'all for the next 20 minutes, and we're going to be done. Elijah went off. And this is what he said. If God be God, then follow him. And if Baal be God, then follow him. But God says, what I'm not going to do is bless your indecision. And the reason why I'm not going to bless your indecision is because Baal is the God of the Canaanites. And I'm about to send you to Canaan. Let's preach. And the reason why I got to know who your God is now is because I'm not about to send you to the Canaanites land where Baal is God because you'll get there and thank Baal for what you have. So I'm not going to bless you until I figure out who you're going to give the credit to. Oh, I'm going to talk to somebody in here today. Some of y'all ain't praised God since we've been here, and that's why you can't get a blessing because God don't know what direction your glory going to go in. But if there's anybody in here that'll say, God, be God, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Where are the people who know the difference between Baal and God? Who know the difference between mammoth and God? Who knows the difference between materialism and the master? I can't give you the broken bag because you'll worship it. Ain't nothing wrong with the broken bag until it becomes your idol. Oh, y'all don't want to say nothing in here today. Ain't nothing wrong with the Louis Vuitton until you spend God's money to purchase it and then come to the altar asking for a release. Your release is on your arm. Your release is in your garage right now. Your release is in your belts and your shoes and your clothes. And the fact that you're living vicariously through your children, spending $500 on shoes that they're going to outgrow in three months, because your child has become your idol, because now if the child looks good, they'll think you're a better mother. Your child can be dressed well, and you can still be a bad parent. Oh, I'm going to help you in this place today. Somebody shall set me free. We don't know how to tell our idols no. We get in the mall, idol. Got to have it. You know you're spending money you shouldn't be spending when you're in the mall. That's what buyer's remorse is. It's when you get home and you say, it don't look the same at home as it did in the mirror. You know why? You have remorse. Because idols only look good in their own temple. Godly. The reason why it looked better in the mall is because the lights were right. The mirror was right. They had it all contoured. But when you got back to reality, it did not look the same because all idols look good in their own homes. This ain't the season to spend your money on idolatry. This is the season to put it up because there's a business in you. There's a company in you. God has an opportunity that's coming your way and you're going to need about $5,000 to pull this trigger. Somebody shout, Lord, send me a business opportunity. You can't be broke when it's your chance. You can't be poor when it's your opportunity. You can't look rich and give poor when it's your chance. If God be God, 
then follow him. If Baal be God, then follow him. You got to make a decision. And you got to make everybody in your ecosystem aware of your decision. Uh, don't call me asking me to go on no vacation. I ain't going. Don't pressure me. Don't call me boring. I'm trying to get somewhere. Matter of fact, if I get where I'm going, I'm going to be able to take all of y'all on voca vacation and you ain't going to have to pay. So y'all go ahead and have fun. Give high fives. Drink my ties. Whatever you got to do. But I'm going to sit here and stack my paper, boo-boo. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to drive this car for two more years. I'm going to put some new tires on it. I'm going to get it detailed and cleaned up. I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm going to live like nobody else so I can live like nobody else. Where are all my millionaires in the room? Let me tell you something, the drought did not come because God was insensitive, the drought came because they were indecisive. It is dry because you can't make a choice. Pick who you're gonna be. Set the stage for your children now. This is what we do. We don't drive what we can't afford. We don't live where we can't afford. We don't try to impress people who won't be impressed after we finish impressing. I'm trying to show you how to make sure that you can get 80% of that stress off of your shoulders right now. Just worried about money. And there's so much of it out here. Have you ever wondered why there's so much world money in the world and why so little of it is in your care? How much money, do you know they printing it right now? Well, they always print it, but you know what I mean. I mean, it just literally, you get a check, you get a check, you get a check. Everybody get checks. Tell me we ain't got no money. We just gave Ukraine another 800 million. We got money. How we got 800 million for defense? But don't have 800 million for infrastructure. In America... Its infrastructure is crumbling because even it, too, got its morals and priorities mixed up. I, I listen to people all the time. I, I, I want to I get this out of your spirit. Listen to me. I want you to get receiving assistance out of your spirit. It's offensive. I want you to get it out of your system. Every time we hear about free money somewhere, oh, where's that, where's that? I want you to get to the point where you make so much you can tell somebody you can get that because all of my needs are taken care of. I want to be the assistance. Are you listening to me? The drought came because they were indecisive. God says, I ain't going to give you a land that Baal is in charge of because when you get there, you're going to thank him for it. So I need to make sure that you praise me now so that when I do give you Canaan, you won't be thanking Baal for it. What if I told you God is holding back the blessing until you release the worship? In spite of what your current situation looks like. Can I just tell you to write this down? Indecision is worse than the wrong decision. Your indecision is costing you more than your wrong decision. Your wrong decision has grace for it. But what can God do with a man who doesn't choose? He can die on the cross if you choose wrong. But what do you leave him to do when you don't choose at all? Pick. You're going to be rich or you're going to be poor? Pick. You're going to be positive or negative? Pick. You're going to have a good attitude or bad attitude? Pick. Stop letting what happened to you choose. Man, I'm trying to get through here. Most of us in here are, we are subject to what happened. What happened is subject to me. Because no matter what happens to me, I still got the victory. Victory is mine. I pick. 
Wake up in the morning, it's going to be a good day. Some of y'all waking up, wonder what kind of day it's going to be. It's going to be a good one. Command it. Somebody say it's going to be a good day. It's going to be a stress-free day. It's going to be an anxiety-free day. It's not going to be a day of me making people pay because they made me sad three years ago. I'm, I'm going to command my day. Pick. Pastor, we're talking about debt. Pick. Choose. Why? Because how you act in a dry place will determine if you can get abundance. Who am I talking to in this place? Who am I talking to online? Just holler at me if I'm talking to you because I'm, I'm still going somewhere. We ain't even got there yet. Now I got to warn you. I got to warn you because after you, after you solve your inconsistency, after you solve your indecisiveness, you're going to suffer from what most of us do when you get there. You ready? After you're no longer inconsistent and you're no longer indecisive, now you have to learn how to handle isolation. <laughs> have you ever heard somebody say, I got all of this and nobody to, to share it with? Now Elijah looks up and sees that he is the only prophet worshiping God. Baal has 450 prophets worshiping him. The Bible says in another 400 in the groves. Groves refers to Asher, who is the cohort of Baal, which means that there is another god named Asher that he is actually supposed to be married to. So now you really have 850 prophets worshiping Baal and Asher and only one, one prophet Worshiping God. And if you read the text and do the, the etymology and the study of it, you find out that the Bible says that there are only 7,000 people left in the whole area that haven't worshipped Baal. That would mean that the whole city of Houston would bow down and worship Baal and only 7,000 of us were left. Only 7,000 people hadn't yet bowed down and said, Baal, you are God. 7,000. This is how powerful idolatry has taken over God's people. Only 7,000. Because the decision you're getting ready to make is not going to be a popular choice. What you're getting ready to do, you might be the only one in your family do it. You might be the only one in your household do it. Nobody else will understand why you're doing it. You're going to have people telling you it don't make sense to do it. They're going to tell you don't be giving that church your money. They're going to tell you this and that and this and that. But they won't understand that one day we're going to all have to say either God is God or Baal is God. He was all alone in his decision. How many of you will be honest? You suffer with isolation. And I'm not talking about having an attitude and want to be alone. That's different. I'm talking about isolation when you want company and can't find it. Hmm. I was watching a video online. This girl, she had uh, a PlayStation 5 remote control. She had something else, I don't know what it was, it might have been a protein shake, and she had a basketball, and she was putting it down. She says, me trying to make somebody fall in love. And she was putting down things that she thought men liked. And she thought that if she changed her personality to love what they love, that they would love her. But in the end, she won't love herself. Because now she's pretending to love something that she has no interest in to get somebody to have interest in her. And once they have interest in her and recognize she didn't have interest in it. Oh, y'all listening to me today. It's, 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 lo everybody's lonely. Everybody's, everybody's looking for something. God, send me my Boaz. Send me my Ruth. Send me my husband. Send me my wife. Send me, send me, send me, send me. And God says, I'll send it when you be. 
Because I'm not, I'm not about to send my blessing to no curse. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Are y'all in here with me today? I'm not, to, I'm not about to send somebody with a million dollars in the bank to somebody who won't save five dollars. It's going to cause conflict, and y'all going to be right at the divorce court. I'm going to send my blessing to a blessing. How many of you know that when you become a blessing, you can receive one? Well, I want to speak to some women in here right now. Don't wait until a man comes to clean up your house. Don't wait until a man comes to clean up your car. Baby, when y'all go on a first date, make sure your car is clean and your house is clean because you're going to try to do something that you're not going to keep up and it's going to frustrate them. I'm telling you right now, don't wait on the husband to be a wife. He who finds a wife. You got to be a wife when we find you. I don't know if somebody in here is going to shout, but I'm going to let that smoke for a little bit. You don't become a wife when you get a husband. You are already a wife. You are already a good thing. Somebody shout, I'm already a wife. I'm already somebody's rib. I'm already somebody's blessing. You ain't no woman because you have a baby. You have a baby because you're a woman. And you ain't no wife because you got a husband. You're a wife because you're a wife. Somebody shout, be it. be it. Most of us wait on the blessing to become it. Be responsible with your finances now. You don't want the man of your dreams walking in and seeing your credit score is three. Not 300. Three. I'm still talking to single people in here. You better learn the blessing of isolation. Adam's best days is when he was in the garden alone. Joseph's best days is when he got the pit and, and, and was on his way to the palace and received the coat. There, there is so much that happens in the isolation. Moses was isolated, put on the Nile River in, in a basket, pitched with slime. Left for three months by himself. Jesus was alone. He was in the garden for 40 days praying because there is something that happens in isolation that doesn't happen when company comes around. Oh, I'm talking to somebody right now. You can't find a good friend nowhere, and you think that there's something wrong with you. God says, baby, this is your isolation season. I'm doing something inside of you that I can't do when you got a crowd. I'm doing something inside of you that you can't get when you got company. Somebody shout, that's why I'm by myself. I'm by myself because God is working on myself, and he don't want to embarrass me in front of company, so he's working on me while I'm only with me. You ain't alone because you're bad. You're alone because God's working on you. He's plucking out some of those bad habits. You recognize things when you're alone that you don't recognize when you got somebody. When you got somebody, you think you're okay. But when you ain't got nobody, make you look at yourself. What's wrong with me? I ain't got nobody. Isolation. How many of y'all are in the season of isolation right now? Man, it looked like we all came here together. We all rode in the same car. Don't know who you can trust. Hey, you're so isolated right now, you see people number on your phone, you be like, ooh. I know if I answer that phone, it's going to be 30 minutes of nothing. I just know. 35 minutes of nothing and negativity. You know what? I'm just going to text him on a Zoom call. I call you. <laughs> Y'all ain't having that many doggone Zoom calls. You ain't that busy. On a Zoom. No, you ain't. <laughs> on a call. With who? Isolation sometimes means you're headed in the right direction. 
Oh, I want to tell somebody in here today, it's okay that they fell off, baby. It's okay that they don't call you like they used to call you. It's okay that when you went through, they were not there for you. But when they went through, you were there for them. It was God showing you who you could trust and who you could not. But I want all of the lonely people in this place today to say out loud, if I got God on my side. As long as I got Jesus. I'm talking about people who don't know. You don't know what's going on around you. Who? Who, where, when, how? Where am I going? Who can I, who can I trust? Who loves me? Who doesn't? Who got my back? John was on the Isle of Patmos by himself because sometimes you can't hear from God until you can't hear nobody else. God said, I had to get them away from you because they had your ear. And I had something I wanted to say. And they would have diluted the advice that I would have given you if you had been in that company. So I let them all scatter. So you could boss up. Where are the bosses in the room? I said, where are the people? Who know in the next three months there's a financial miracle coming in your direction that you don't even see coming. God says, I've been waiting on you to solve the indecisiveness. I've been waiting on you to solve the inconsistency. And the work starts in the isolation. You thought y'all was real cool. You ain't never thought that thing was going to go south. Now look at you. Victim of trusting the wrong person. They walked away with everything. You got nothing out to deal. Here you are crying. And they on their third person since they left you. And that was last week. <laughs> Anybody who can move on that fast moved on before they moved on. Now you put that in your pipe and smoke it. Huh? Isolation. Some of y'all can be in a room full of people, you still feel alone. You call it, I'm an introvert. No, you're just isolated. <laughs> I'm just, I'm an introvert. I just, I don't like people. But you're always looking for people. You're not no introvert. You're in isolation. God took the taste of people out of your mouth for a season. Some of y'all can't stand nobody. Everybody get on your nerve. Ugh, look how she walked. How many of y'all have ever been through that season? Everything everybody do get in there. Oh, she breathing. Oh, never seen nobody breathe the way she breathed. <laughs> I want you to be decisive and consistent when I give you this word you got to go practice it right away you can't you can't just be a hearer of the word you got to be a doer of the word consistency you can't read two books this month and then none for the rest of the year consistent if you can't run on the treadmill, walk every day. But just be. Anything that you only do when you feel like doing, you won't do for long. I'm telling you, that you're going to have to do some stuff you're not going to feel like doing. 
don't feel like saying sorry. That's a dry place. Most of us think our money is held up by our spending habits. No, it's you. Ahab's condition was the reason for the drought, not his spending habits. God can't send the flow in the direction of a dam. And when you got walls everywhere in your life, you're wondering why it can't get to you because it's hitting the blockage of your attitude. <laughs> Jezebel's condition is why her house couldn't be blessed. Grudges will keep you from getting blessed. Mm. You better hear what I'm telling you. Remember he said, Ahab, the decisions you and your father made are the reason why it is not raining on your life. Not how much you spent at the Galleria, but how many people have you walked past and wouldn't pay a compliment. Mm. But let me tell you, when you get your mind made up that you want to get free, how many of you know God will speak to you? Some of your best ideas come in your isolation. I can see Elijah saying, hmm, hmm, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this thing? Okay, all right, speak to me, God, speak to me. Hmm. I don't know what I'm going to do, God, but I know that I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. I don't know. If I, if I knew, I'd have, I, I would have already done it. But, but, but I, I need to hear from just a word from the Lord. Just, to, just to give me a word, Lord. Give me a word, Lord. Give, I, I got it. He said, let's have a contest. Let's have a contest. Let's have a fire fight. And it's a fair fight. Because both gods are good with fire. Not a fair, not an unfair fight. It, he, he didn't ask Baal to raise nobody from the dead. He wasn't known for that. Because Baal, by definition, means God of fire. So we're going to make this fight fair. In fact, the word Baal in the Saxon terminology is Baal fire or bonfire. So anytime you say bonfire, you're saying Baal fire. So both gods are good with fire. Baal is known as the God of fire, but so is Jehovah. There was a man named Moses who was at a bush. And when he called on the Lord, we now refer to it as the burning bush because God calls fire. Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace. And God steps in the fire with them because he is also the God of fire. The Holy Spirit is a consuming fire because the God that we serve is also the God of fire. So you have fire God versus fire God. I almost called this sermon the fire man because you got one fire man against another fire man. And now the stage is set. Elijah says, let's build an altar. And y'all bring two bulls. Y'all keep a bull. Your Bible may say an ox. And I'll keep a bull. And what you're going to do is cut it in pieces. And you're going to sacrifice it at the altar. Y'all ready? Let's get it going. He says, you cut yours up. I'll cut mine up. And we're going to see who God is. And whichever God sends fire... Let him be God. Oh, y'all not here with me today. So the Bible says that they cut up their bull and they put it on the altar. And his idea was to cause an inferno. He says, y'all go. They says, Baal, send down fire.
<laughs> Elijah's so petty. Go read your Bible. Elijah said, is your God on vacation? No, no, no. Go, go read your Bible. He said, did he step away? Is, 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 he, is he on vacation? Or maybe he can't talk right now. Or maybe he's singing to his wife. Is, what, where's your God? You know, do it again. Call on him. Bell! Fire! Uh, Bell, it ain't looking good out here. You about to embarrass us. Bell, where is the fire? And the Bible says there was no answer. Elijah said, <laughs> Woo! I said, all right, let's get it on. He says, uh, let's rebuild the fire. Let's rebuild the altar. He got 12 stones and he rebuilt it. Now, now you got to understand that there was something very, very, very tricky that could have happened. Because in the days of Baal worship, they dug trenches underneath their altars and they put priests underneath so that way, when they called on Baal for fire, the priest would light the fire and they would think that Baal did it. <laughs> Elijah said, uh, it's empty down there, right? And since there were no priests underneath there, no fire lit. All right, Elijah says, let's, let's do this. Let's dig a trench around my altar. And he says, let's put some fire wood in it. So they put fire wood in it. He says, and just to make this thing a little more interesting, uh, can somebody pour water on the wood? He says, not good enough. He said, go get another barrel of water and pour it on the wood. He says, you know what? One more time. Go get some more water and pour it on the wood. Before I can be practical, can I be theological? I see a shadow. The fight between Baal and God happened on Mount Carmel. The fight between God and man happened on Mount Calvary. They dug trenches to put the wood in. They had to dig a hole to put the cross in. The wood at Baal's altar needed a bull. At the altar of God, he is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And they poured water on the blood. You may say, where is the water at Calvary? When they stuck them in the side. The Bible says water and blood came streaming down. And the Bible says that Elijah called from heaven and fire came down. Watch this. And it burnt up the sacrifice burnt up the stones, burnt up the water, and burnt up the wood. Are y'all hearing me today? The reason why it didn't happen for Baal is because they were using false fire. And you got to be careful when you look at people who you think on fire, but it's false fire. You think they hot, but it's false fire. You think that Gucci real? That Gucci ain't real. It's false fire. You think that Louis Vuitton makes them something? It ain't nothing. It's just false fire. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't want no false fire. I need the real fire of the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, y'all on the gram holding money to your ear, but that's a disconnect. We don't call it money over here. It's false fire. A lot of you are following people into a false narrative thinking that if you show more stuff, that you're going to be more blessed. And all you're looking at is somebody who had a priest under the altar, lighting the fire, making you think they had something they didn't have, making you spend what you don't have to get what they don't have. False fire. Rolexes with no pension plans. False fire. Diamonds on their neck, on their wrist, on a ring, no dental plan. False fire. Anybody who can buy a Patek Philippe should have insurance. Rolls Royce, 
no savings account. Huh? Ashton Martin, don't pay child support. False. Fire. Oh, you ain't got to say man, but we came here to get free today. Somebody shout false fire. But tell somebody, I didn't come this far to fake it. I came here to get a real blessing. Somebody ought to start to shout fire down from heaven. Say, God, I brought these bills to you today. I need you to burn this stuff up. God, I brought this student loan debt here today. I need you to burn this stuff up. The Bible says, watch this, that the fire fell on the altar. I knew you weren't going to hear it. I practiced that in my mind. I knew you weren't going to hear it. I knew you weren't going to hear it. The Bible says that the fire fell on the altar. Keep saying this. The fire didn't fall on the people. The fire fell. The fire didn't come to where they were. The fire fell. It didn't come to them. They had to come to it. And the reason some people don't get the fire is because they want it delivered. God says, I'm going to let the fire fall at the altar. And if you want the fire, you got to get where the fire is for. Now, why do you think I had you to put your debt in the proper place of the altar? Bring it up on the screen. Because outside, I had already planned to ask God to bring the fire. Are y'all praying with me? And you did it by faith. I'm telling you right now, the fire is consuming everything that the devil has stolen. Somebody begin to worship. I said, somebody worship. There go your bills. There go your student loans. There goes your mortgage. There goes your pain. There goes your anxiety. Somebody shout, burn, baby, burn. Somebody shout, it's getting lit in here. It's getting lit in here. Are y'all praying with me? Give your neighbor a high five and shout, neighbor, fire. We about to set it off in here. Somebody shout, fire. Everything that the devil has taken, God says, I'm about to restore it. Somebody shout, fire. Look at it burn. Look at it burn. Look at it burn. Look at it burn. One by one. Look at it burn. There goes your future. There goes your past. There goes your pain. Burn, baby, burn. It's about to burn. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire. Shout it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Burn it up, God. I got something I'm trying to do. Burn it up, God. I need the freedom. Burn it up, God. I cancel the debt. Burn it up, God. I cancel the debt. Burn it up, God. I cancel the debt. 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 I need some of y'all to act like that barrel and say like Jeremiah, it's like fire. Oh, shut up in my bones. Somebody shout. Somebody give him glory. Somebody shout it, yeah. It's over. It's over. It's canceled. It's free. 
is done. Who the Son has set free is free indeed. Come by here, Holy Ghost. Are y'all praying with me? I want you to understand something. The fire didn't just burn what they put in it. It burned everything without their consent. God told me to tell you that there were some things that you forgot to put on the altar. But he told me to tell you that's gone too. Shout yeah! Shout yeah! Good God Almighty, God told me to tell you he just burnt your child's death. Did you hear what I said? He just burnt your daughter's death. He just burnt your son's death. Over the next 30 seconds, I want everybody in here who ain't afraid of the devil to put the enemy on notice. You should have killed me when you had the chance. But I'm about to change your generation. I'm doing this for my son. I'm doing this for my daughter. The fire. The fire. The fire. It's coming down. Come on and give him glory. Come on and give him glory. Yeah. Can I tell you one more thing? When the fire fell, the Bible says that they fell. Because some people are too proud. to get a perfect work in your life. But I need you to put your pride on that altar. Don't just burn up your bills. Put your anxiety on there. Put your cancer, put your lupus on there. While it's burning, you might as well go get it all. Put your brain tumor on there. Put your breast cancer on there. Somebody shout it. Put your high blood pressure on there. Put your diabetes on there. Put your stomach pain on there. Put your back ache on there. There's one more thing. I need somebody with an Isaac spirit. I need somebody with an Abraham spirit to take your Isaac Oh, y'all didn't hear me. You better get your baby on that altar. God, you can have Jessica too. You can have Melissa. You can have Daryl. You can have John. Put it all. Shout it's done. It's done, 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 it's done. Do me one more favor. Look at your neighbor and shout, neighbor. I'm speaking prophetically. You are standing next to somebody who's dead free. You're standing next to somebody whose debts are canceled. If you believe it, ah, yeah. Ain't no more change holding me. Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, I'm free. 
Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, I'm free. Somebody shout, I'm free. I'm free. Somebody say testimonies. Testimonies, testimonies, testimonies. Testimonies, testimonies. Immediately, suddenly, testimonies. In the name of Jesus. I'm not gonna wait till the battle is over. I said, I'm not gonna wait until the battle is over. I'm not waiting on an envelope in the mail to confirm it. I believe. Somebody shout, I believe. Somebody shout, I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. Have no thought for tomorrow. You ain't got to worry about it. Tomorrow's not your responsibility. The reason why we can't be consistent in what we're supposed to be doing is we keep trying to do God's job. Let it burn. Let your thoughts burn with it. I am telling you something. 
that I know for sure. And I want you to hear the words that are coming out of my mouth so that way if you think you've got everything that you need from me, I'm getting ready to shock you with something. God is getting ready to take us to a level. Listen to me. Don't worry about that. The devil don't want you to hear it. We'll, we'll get there. He always do this when it's time to go. Always. We're getting ready to go to a level where the knowledge you have won't work anymore. So what I'm giving you will get you out of where you are but it will not get you into where we're going. Okay? I'm telling you right now to get insurance, but there's going to come a point in your life where you're what they call self-insured, where it doesn't make sense to spend money on insurance because you have enough in your account that you insure yourself. So, So I want you to see this. I'll, I'll teach you this, but we're going there. Remember, last week I was telling you about having a savings account. Okay? Now, a savings account is where you need to start. But have you ever noticed that the bank tells you to save the money, but they don't save it? A bank has no savings account. They take your money and invest it. Because you're going to go to a level where you recognize that there are certain systems that are set up for people who don't follow our rules. So I'm going to show you in a later reiteration where you keep little money on your person and have a lot in the market or in investment or in real estate because it takes a dollar and turns it into four. In your bank account, I knew a man who once had a million dollars in a Bank of America account that he forgot about for a year. And when he went back and remembered it and checked the balance, his balance was $1,008,000. $8,000 return on how many millions they made off the million. So I'm telling you, what I'm telling you right now is only going to work to get you out of where you are. Then you're going to have to stay with me because next year we're going somewhere else. I learn every day. I learn every day. And the other thing that I'm going to do, and God showed me this, I have been giving away good stuff for free too long. And when I have to take something that's complex and try to explain it in a sermon for people who have sleep doing it anyway, I'm going to start having classes and symposiums where you're going to have to pay to get in and we can sit for hours and talk. And let me tell you why it's going to cost. It's going to cost to keep cheap mindsets out the room. I don't want you surrounded by cheap people when this thing is coming up because their energy going to mess you up. You know some people will never grow. And I'm talking to everybody around the world. I'm not just talking to you. That you can't get what I got in a 45-minute sermon. There are people all around the world investing in their growth. The church wants to get it in a sermon. It takes more than that. And I know this ain't for everybody. But I don't want to spend enough time with you to give you what I have. I need to be able to sit in a chair for six hours if I need to. And bring in people to pour into you. And they're not coming because we pray. they coming because we pay. And let me tell you how I know I'm on to something. Cleo, I was in a meeting last Friday where nobody in the room except for me was worth less than $65 million. The richest man in the room was worth $1.2 billion. And the only person they remembered in the room was me. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Not because I'm no preacher. And it ain't because I'm anointed. It ain't had nothing to do with that. You know why they remember me? 
is because when the billionaire was talking, I went up and I put thousands of dollars in his hand. And I walked away. I never let him see my face. I let him watch my back. So you know what happens? Goodness and mercy will. Three hours later, he came looking for me, and he said in front of the group, he says, who is that man that put that money in my hand? I reluctantly said, I. He said, let me give you a story. He said, when I was eight years old, my father took me to the dentist. I had a quarter that my dad had given me. I was playing with it. The dentist said, give me that quarter. He said, nope, I'm keeping it. He said, his daddy grabbed him by his shirt and said, son, never deny a rich man. He said that he got out of the dental chair with his quarter, went outside, tripped and fell, and dropped the quarter down the drain. And that's what happens when you are selfish. You lose it. You lose it. You lose it. You could either give it or lose it, and they don't feel the same if you got the right heart. He remembered me because I sold into him. I am the poorest person in the room, but I sold the biggest seed. Not having as much as somebody else doesn't give you the right to be selfish. And because of that, can I give you the end of the story? The rich man walks up to me and says, son, I'm getting ready to teach you everything I know. And guess who I'm going to tell it to as soon as he give it to me? He doesn't fly commercial. He owns his own jet. It's $60 million. He just bought a house for $40 million cash. Are you listening to me? See, but the rules up there are different than these down here. They're they not talking about IRAs up there. You hear me? And he says to me, he says, I want to be a blessing to you. He says, anytime you want me, let me speak to your congregation for free. Let me tell you what I ain't going to do. I ain't going to bring him here for people to be texting while he's talking. So we're going to make the room exclusive for the people who say, whatever it take for me to get there, I will do whatever it takes. With one stroke of a pen, with one stroke of a pen. This is the God's honest truth. God, if I'm not telling the truth, you hear me openly. With one, and it was really online with a transfer and a wire. With one stroke of a pen, I increased my investment by 6% in five days. Just by understanding the stock market in a way that I've, the way they're not teaching us, who you know own stock that know what they're doing. I didn't even know, <laughs> I didn't even know that whenever an IPO goes out, that they invite rich people to the party, sell the stock to them for a dollar or two, put it on the market and resell it. See, the problem is you're buying stock at resale. So it's just like going to the store. The shirt ain't worth 900 it's worth whatever they say it is. So the stock will be a penny. They'll buy up 10 million pennies, take the stock up to $80, and become billionaires overnight, and then say, oh, you want to own stock? We'll sell it to you for 85 Facebook's stock was sold to rich people at $2. When it went on the market, it was for 35 and now you can't even really buy stock in, in companies that are doing well. Why? Because it's eight, nine, ten hundred, ten thousand dollars a stock at Bitcoin. Think about it. Who, who, who gonna buy one coin for sixty thousand dollars? For it to drop and be worth twenty. 
See, these things that they don't teach us. And can I be frank, locked our community out. But if God be God, I'm bringing all of y'all in with me. I'm bringing all of y'all in with me. I'm going to kick the door down off the hinges and I'm bringing you in with me. Who's going? Who's going? Who's going? There's one thing you know about Acts, these preachers. I give you anything I got. Because if I give it to you, it, it ain't nothing off my back. You can't have what's mine. Any book I read, I'll tell them. I don't hoard nothing. Any book I read, read it. Give them my book. I was, I was at church today. man said, I like the jacket you had on. The reason why I pre preach in a jogging suit, I gave a man my suit jacket today. I ain't have a suit. I gave it to him on my way out the door. So, so now I have to preach in a jogging suit because somebody wanted something I have. If I got it, it's yours. But you got to be able to fit it. He was my size. Oh, y'all didn't hear what I said. You can't ask for my stuff and don't be my size. So we about to go up. And you about to be isolated. And you're going to have to fix that inconsistency. And you're going to have to fix that indecisiveness. And you're going to have to know what to do with an idea. And you got to stop being cheap. Because cheap doesn't mean you don't have money. It just means that you've decided something ain't worth it. Because if you find out it's worth it, you'll spend it on it. How many of y'all like to eat? Get over there and spend 200 on a steak. Oh, yeah, we do it. Come on, y'all. A family meal, it's, a, it's, 300, it's $300. My family is 9000 our, our kids eat crab and steak and lobster and everything. They don't know nothing about no chicken nuggets. And everybody get dessert. <laughs> I'd be looking like Jesus for 500, 600, 700, 800. 900. Why goo? Oh, Jesus. Why not? Why do? <laughs> You're going to get to a place where it don't matter. Just sit there and enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself. Why do all of this and can't bless the ones you love? That's what you do it for. So we're going up. The debt is burned. The debt is burned. It's burned. We're going to, I can't wait, because we, we, we bought this building. It's about an $8 million building, this one right here. I think we got somewhere over about, I don't know, Jack, about $3 million left on this building. I'm, I'm trying to burn that, y'all, because the house has to be an example. It has to be an example. I don't want, I don't want, do you know how much more we could do in a community with no debt? Our mortgage is our highest bill. And that's what happens when you have a big house. It costs a lot. When you got a lot of kids, you got to get a big house. Can I tell you what I see, though? This house is too small. You know what I see? I, I, I keep seeing, I don't know how, I'm going to have to bring an engineer and find out how can we wrap this whole thing in seats. I just keep seeing it. Because the Lord ain't telling me to add services. I'm getting older. I got to add space. But I just keep, I just keep seeing did you all know that the ceiling goes up 75 feet? That ceiling is 25 feet lower than the pitch of the roof. I've been up there. Not smart, but I've been up there. <laughs> so we got more space up there than we do down here. We going up? Let's go up. Let's go up then. If it's up, then it's up, then it's up, then it's up. We're going up. We're going, we're going to give today before we leave. We're going to give before we leave. Don't move, because I'm going to let you go. It's only 823. We're in great time. Y'all shocked. They're like, whoa, Jesus. I was determined not to keep you long, because I knew you had come twice. Um, if you have the faith to do it, I want you to get in your mind right now, what is the payment on your largest debt? And I want you to sow that payment tonight as a way of snowballing and paying off everything 
that the enemy is using to lock you down. Let me tell you, your attitude about giving influences the return on that investment. When giving gives you anxiety and you have to fight with yourself, God, you're showing God you ain't ready for what you're asking for. I have never given God anything that I haven't gotten back. Why would I give a billionaire money? He don't need money. But I do. This is the thing that killed me. I told the man, I said, sir, I didn't even know what to do. I said, if you teach me everything that you know, I'll tithe to you. He said, I made 360 million this year. I said, well, then I will be making a $36 million check to you. He said, you would do that? I said, I do it every week. He said to me, listen to me. This is the mindset. He said, Keon, I don't need any more money. I need more stories. I need evidence that what I do works. And that is when you know you're blessed. I want you to get to that place where money is not trepidation for you. It comes and it goes. It's called currency. It's, it's, it, the only people who are broke are the people who keep it. I don't want a pool of money. I want a, a river. I want, I want a flow. I want it to move and go, come and go. So I want you to get that seed in your hand. Get your phone. Some of our ushers have their envelopes right now. You can't give God the debt and not give him a seed. Let's seal this transaction. I've got mine. And then I'm letting you go home. Just stay right there. Just stay right there. I don't know what y'all, I want y'all to sing yet, but we're just going to stay right there. I don't know. I want you to get your gift. Whatever your largest debt is, I want you to get that seed right now. And I want you to sow it into God taking care of the rest. When you get it, stand right back on your feet. If your feet hurt, take them heels off. I know most heels is two hours, so you got about 34 minutes before they start hurting. I should get that gift. If you don't have that, if it's too big, I just want you to get something that you'll say, God, here, here's my, here's my, my communication with you. Here, here, I'm, just, I'm just leaving something. Those of you watching online, those of you watching online, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you in Chicago. I'm talking to you in Miami. I'm talking to you in Ghana. I'm talking to you in Nigeria. Those of you in Nigeria, I'll be there next month. I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. Lagos, I'm coming next month. The Bible says that the anointing falls down Aaron's beard and then it goes to the robe, which means that whatever you're covered by, that's the same oil that transfers to your life. Can I tell you something right now? I am in the best position I've ever been in my life. I am in the best position I've ever been in my life. Ideas that I've had in my head for years are all of a sudden working. God has connected me with people who see the potential of what I've been talking about and just grabbing a hold of it. Just grabbing a hold of it. You're going to get to the place where you can turn everything you do into money. Y'all don't want to say amen. Everything you do, you can make it profitable. You can make it profitable. My wife and I got married, and, and because she does TV, the network said, um, Pastor Henderson, we want to, uh, Lady Shana, we want to film the wedding. I said, y'all can film it, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you now. You, you can film it. You can film it. And we'll show it, but it's going to cost you something. 
So we negotiate the deal. Now watch this. Most people that went after the money, now I went after it. I don't, I don't want to tell you no lie. I went after it. And I got it. We got it. But what I got that was more important is a producer's credit. So now you're looking at a producer that has a television series coming out on a network, three, a three episode series. So in essence, they paid for us to get married. You better look at me. You better look at me. Everything you do, everything you do has a value to it. Problem is you don't know your value. You don't think nobody will pay for it. You don't think nobody want to see it. God created you to be visible. Most people leave, they wed and cry. We was like, hurry up. Everything, somebody say, everything I do is profitable. I rem where's Nick at? Nick around here somewhere. Nick, Nick, where's he at? Oh man, look boy. This boy came to me, how are you when I met you? 22 years old, picked me up from somewhere one day in his car, he picked me up. I said, how much money am I gonna pay you for this run? His, his prices done went way up, so y'all bless the Lord for him. But when I met him, his prices were $75 a run to the airport. I paid him $75, I said, how long do it take me to get me to the airport? You said 30 minutes. I said, so you about to drop me off at the airport. I paid you $75 for 30 minutes to hurry up and get back to a job that only pays you $12 an hour? I said, that don't make no sense. If, if you can pick me up, you can pick up somebody else. Now he's got a multiple six-figure business, picking up everybody from the likes of Chris Brown to who else? Drake. Every time I, he sent me his picture, he done pulled up the Drake plane. I'm like, you're going to have to hurry up because mine coming behind him now. You... All from, it all started with taking me to Bush to now he feeds his house because there is a way to monetize everything you do. You got to stop giving everything away. And I know you think you're doing a good thing. I'm just a giver. But you better learn to be a receiver. Somebody shout, I receive. I speak millions in your hands if you're a receiver. Somebody shout, I receive. I receive. The debt that was on your house will not transfer to your children. I, I, I want somebody to say, I receive. I receive. You have to borrow money to go to college. Listen, they won't because God's getting ready to bless you where you can pay the bill. You don't want your children having bills when they get out of school. Somebody say, I believe. I believe. How many of y'all believe? Don't just bring your bills, bring your belief. I'm still giving somebody an opportunity to make up their mind. Ain't not, this ain't my money. This ain't nothing. Ain't got nothing to do with me. This is for you. This is going towards whatever we got going. This ain't got nothing to do with me. Everybody got your gift ready. How many people want to open the business in the next 6 to 12 months? Ooh, when I tell you I got a business idea, I ain't going to tell you right now. I meant what I said. What if I told you I found a way for you to make income that legally can't be taxed? Woo! But I ain't telling you today. Show sure ain't. Hmm, you better. Y'all ready? Hold your gift up in the air. Lord God, send down fire. consuming fire that whatever the enemy has planned for this seed will be canceled in the name of Jesus I don't need what I'm about to release this will not affect my livelihood what I'm about to release this is a seed that you have given to a sower God thank you that you created me to be a sowing machine I'm going to see sow in every season for every reason at every place that you call me and God when you give me the instruction give me the faith to follow it 
and then back it up with your word. For God is not a man that he should lie, nor is he the son of man that he should repent. If you believe it, shout hallelujah in this place. Pass your gift to my right, your left. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of y'all been blessed tonight? I find it not robbery to ask the question if there's anybody in this room that has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It don't make any sense to give him your treasure, but you haven't given him your heart. It doesn't make any sense to have a savings account and not be saved at all. Above all, we do kingdom business. And we are trying to rob the enemy of his victory. And you are the prize. And God is the source. If you're in this room and you don't know Jesus in what we call the pardon of your sin. And you want to be connected. Somebody say connected. To the triune God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, Creator. Son, Redeemer. Holy Spirit guide. All three make one. None can get to the Father except by the Son. And there is no other name by which men can be saved. If you've never confessed out of your mouth, Jesus, your Lord, or you don't believe it in your heart, can I tell you that's why we came tonight? And don't you be embarrassed about the fact that you haven't done it. I don't care if you've been an usher for three years. I don't care if you've been on the praise team. I don't care if you're on the camera. I don't care if you're in the sound booth. I don't care if you're a technician. I don't care if you're cleaning up the church. Wherever you are in this room, if you haven't confessed, drop your instrument, drop your camera, drop your pride and meet me at this altar and give God your whole heart, your life, soul, and spirit. And I want you to praise God as they're coming. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you, my sister. Come, come see me at this altar. Come on, come on, Lighthouse. Make a big deal. Hallelujah. The devil lost another one. The devil lost another one. He lost. Here's another one. God bless you. Come on, volunteers. You know we practice this on Super Monday. You know what we do. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. They're still coming. They're still coming. God bless you, my brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, my sister. They're still coming. They're still coming. God bless you. Here's a family. Come on, Lighthouse. Sign.
just got to tell you. Y'all going to tell me what God can't do. So I, I didn't remember this. She said to me, she said, you prayed for her. She said two years ago, you prayed for her because her and her husband at the beginning of 12 years couldn't have children. I prayed for them and now they're holding two. Listen, let me tell you, let me tell you why this is important. But she said to me, she says, but I lost one and now I'm dealing with postpartum. Because let me tell you something, the devil won't let you celebrate for a second. Look at how he works. You finally get what you're asking for. And now you're depressed about what happened. He is a deceiver. Everybody stretch your hand this way. There are thousands of mothers holding their hand in your direction right now. God, we're praying that you would lift the weight. No, cancel this debt. Give her the ability to enjoy what she prayed for. I pray that the transference of the pressure doesn't go from the mother to the child. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, no weapon formed against you is prospering. And I want you to know right now, you're worried about your daughter, but I want you to know that God is even blocking her from understanding what is taking place in your heart right now. And you're about to be healed in the name of Jesus because you have thousands of women going to God on your behalf. Come on, mothers, let me hear you. So God, right now in the name of Jesus, we're not going to wait until tomorrow to praise you for it. We're going to sacrifice this depression at the altar right now. And God, we, we release it and we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would give her the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven is that you would give her the joy of her salvation that you would give her to prosper and be in good health. God, please, please God. Please, please, we beg you, we beg you, we beg you, if you've done it before, you can do it again, in Jesus' name. Come somebody, show God that you're grateful, show God that you're grateful. There ought to be some mothers in here right now that... Any women here say, I was there. I understand that. I was there. To all of you who came, I want you to understand something. I want you to hear the words that are coming out of my mouth. You just made the best decision you could have ever made in your entire life. <laughs> what you have just done, you don't even have an idea. What you have just done. So the devil had a plan for you. And that was that you would burn in what the scripture calls the lake of fire. That means that everything that you had been doing that wasn't right was getting you closer to that. So if you would have died in a car accident yesterday, I couldn't have done anything for you. But while you were texting and driving, and when you forgot to let the garage door down and nobody came in, and when you felt your heart skip a beat and you felt like you were having anxiety, was going to have a heart attack, but God didn't let it be so. And when somebody looked at you and thought they were going to rob you, but they saw another man standing behind you and didn't know who it was. He let you survive so you can get to this altar and repeat these words after me. I need you to say it. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. And I believe in my heart that God raised his son Jesus Christ from the dead and based on that I want to be saved enter into my heart I want to be a Christian and be saved forevermore if you just said that 
and you believe it in your heart, you have just robbed the devil of the victory and there is no condemnation that can come to you and you will forever be with God in heaven. Now I need somebody in here to raise up a praise. Come on, somebody raise up a praise. Raise up a praise. Say I'm saved. 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 I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm saved. And guess what? You can never be unsaved. The devil gonna play tricks on your mind and make you think you can do something to reverse this. But let me tell you, salvation is so complete, you can't work your way out of it. So you good. Now all you have to do from this point going forward, and, it, and you might be looking, where's the fireworks? No, it's happening on the inside. You don't even know it. There's a change happening inside right now. You don't even know it. And hell is mad. They have plans for you. But they won't be able to exercise them. I want you to take them in the back. I want you to make sure you get them connected. I want you to make sure they understand the importance of this journey. And listen, we're going to love you no matter what. Ain't nobody here perfect, so you ain't got to worry about that. It ain't them good people and y'all up here, they just like you, they just like me, us in this together. And we just waiting on God to make a change in our life. Thank y'all so much for coming. We love you. Thank you for making this day special. Come on and give it up for them. Just follow them right there and they'll take you where you need to go. Come on, Lighthouse, make some big noise. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. tell y'all something. I cannot tell you how many times somebody came to this church and said they couldn't have children. And the Lord led me to pray for them. And then they be bringing two and three of them back. So I'm just going to tell you, if you don't mean it, don't ask me. Because when I pray, they just be coming. Babies everywhere. This be happening. So if you don't really mean it, if you count on the fence, just ask me to pray to God, but don't, don't come up here and get to the altar. Something's going to change. I'm proud of you. I'm excited about what's getting ready to happen in your life. You better be excited about it. Don't go home depressed. Don't go home despondent. Them bills on that countertop, they was there when you left. They're going to be there when you get back. But when you go back different, you're going to change the atmosphere of your house. And things that used to disrupt your house ain't going to disrupt your house no more. Somebody say, peace in my house. Peace in my bedroom. Peace in my kitchen. Peace in my dining room. Peace in my living room. Peace in the man cave. Peace in the closet. Peace, 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 peace. I'll see you all on Sunday. Listen, I'll be preaching at the South location this Sunday. We're going to have a good time over there. Then we'll be right back here on the first Sunday. I believe that God is getting ready to do some things. And don't you, be, don't you miss out on this, because somebody shout, I'm in the number. God, dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. Allow us to get home and find everything in order. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody shout, amen. Tell somebody on the way out, I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it.